Hey guys, welcome to our last topic in chapter 16. In this topic we're going to review enzyme coupled receptors. This is another class of receptors that are really important in cell communication. So it's really important that you understand this too. And as I said, I expect you to be able or I expect you to make sure you really understand the examples we're going to go through here um, in these next couple slides. They may seem basic, but they're really tricky and all these pathways that we're going to talk about are really important pathways to make sure you have a handle on. As always, make sure you pause, go back, go through these, bring any questions you have to, to class for us to go over. So here's our topic outline. Just like with GPCRs, we're going to talk about what enzyme coupled receptors do. We're going to talk about how they work and then we're going to talk about the evolution of these. So it's important that you understand this and how they vary, how they differ to, from GPCRs. So let's talk about our topic objectives. As Just like I said in the last one, we have it's a short list. There's only four, but they're really tricky. So it's really important to understand them and have a really firm grasp of these. I expect you to be able to talk about all the examples that we've talked about in the last two topics in class and on an exam. Alright, so what are enzyme coupled receptors? If you remember when we were talking about lipid membranes, I was talking about how everything's so fluid and I showed you guys that video from Amgen where everything was moving around. Those and those things that were moving around in the big proteins, those were enzyme coupled receptors that they were showing. And what they are is they're transmembrane proteins and they work in transduction pathways. As opposed to GPCRs which have seven pass-throughs, these enzyme coupled receptors tend to only have one, which means that they typically form a dimer when they bind to their signal and we'll talk about that in the next slide. Also, these enzyme coupled receptors tend to be growth factors, so they're ones that are involved in growth, prol proliferation, differentiation, survival, which means that they're huge targets in cancer pathways because as you can imagine, if a growth factor gets out of control, what are you going to end up with? A tumor. So it's important that you understand that, that these enzyme coupled receptors are big cancer targets and, are, um, and have a huge role in this. They also can mediate our cytoskeleton change. And the biggest class of these are known as receptor tyrosine kinases, or RTKs. And we're going to talk about those here in the next couple slides. So as I mentioned, enzyme coupled receptors work by forming dimers. Now they can be heterodimers or homodimers. They're not always um, specific and it just depends on the, t on the specific enzyme that we're talking about. And as you can see here, we have some, R um, some tyrosine, um, some RTKs here. And what happens is they bind to their signal molecule and they come together forming this dimer. That activates that kinase region right there in the middle, that big knob. And what this does is it causes phosphorylated tyrosine. And this is an activated RTK. At this point, there's a variety of intracellular signals that can bind to it and become activated, which then it continues a signal transduction pathway. And so we're going to look at a couple examples of these here in the next couple slides. So make sure you understand this basic concept of signal binds, the two receptors come together, they become phosphorylated and then trigger a whole bunch of different um, signal cascades from there. And there can be almost there can be upwards of 20 different molecules bound to these at a single time. So as you can imagine, the single single signal can create quite a response in the cell. So let's look at the GTPase RAS. So RAS is a really big component of these pathways. And so it's really important that you understand how this RAS protein works because it's a huge it has a huge role intracellularly. So what happens here is just like we talked about, the signal binds, the two um, receptors come together, form a dimer, they become activated, and then the RAS activating protein will bind, which activates RAS, which is going to have the GDP that's in, docked in it removed and have a GTP added, which is going to activate that RAS protein. And this RAS protein is now a secondary messenger that's going to go on and perform another function. So in this first example, what we have here is our activated RAS is going to come over and activate the MAP um, kinase pathway, or the MAP kinase pathway. MAP stands for uh, mitogen activating proteins, and it works to relay a bunch of signals um, to change protein and gene activity. So it's a huge pathway in the cell. So what happens is RAS is going to activate the MAP kinase kinase, which is in turn going to activate the MAP kinase kinase, which is in turn going to activate the MAP kinase. 
So it's a, the, I know that it's kind of a funny series of names, but you know, you have the kinase activates the kinase kinase, which, or you have the kinase kinase kinase, which activates the kinase kinase, and then the kinase kinase activates the kinase, which will then activate a whole bunch of different pathways depending on what the purpose of the signal is. So this is the MAP kinase pathway. Another example is the PI3 kinase pathway, and this is the inositol phosphate pathway, just like we talked about before. And in this case, the activated PI3 kinase is going to um, activate that inositol phospholipid, and that phosphorylated inositol phospholipid is going to travel down and work on other ki um, kinases. And one of the examples here is activated the AKT pathway. Once again, AKT is responsible for um, growth and survival, which makes it another big cancer target. So this is another, you'll hear, if you do anything in cancer research, you'll hear a lot of people talking about the AKT pathway. This is that pathway. So once again, here's another example. And it, I, hopefully you're noticing that this is a same secondary messenger that's acted on by GPCRs, and that's because, as we talk about, cells have tons of redundancy in them. And so this is just another way that the same pathway, so you may be able to knock out one way something's working, but you have to be able to knock out um, the entire um, process if you want to completely inhibit something. So another example is the JAK-STAT pathway. Now this one's a little different. In this case, we have the um, two proteins are going to come together with the signal prolactin. And you can see the JAKs on here. The JAKs are going to become activated and the STATs will then combine to them. Now these STATs are signal transducers and activators. And they are um, different because they are um, they are not RTKs, and they are associated with a special cytoplasmic enzyme known as the tyrosine kinase. So it's a little bit different. And these activated stats will go, will remove themselves from the receptors, travel through the cell, and activate transcription. And so this is a slightly different variation on how enzyme-coupled receptors will work. Whereas the other ones are using RTKs, this one is using a tyrosine kinase, which is inside the, which is in the cytoplasm. So we talked a lot about these different receptors and it's important to understand that communication evolved as a survival mechanism and this makes sense, right? Cells needed to know what was going on around them. Even the most basic single cell organism has to understand or has to have a sense of what the environment's like as so, so that it can control and regulate the in internal functions of it. And we see similar pathways in all of our different species, but they're all a little different. And it's important to see that enzyme-coupled receptors um, are used mainly in plants, whereas GPCRs are our main, um, our main receptors in animal cells. And so you can see that through the tree of life, there is a divergence in how these receptors are used. So it's important to understand that, that there's this evolution process and it varies on the organism as to what's going to be used. And lastly, as we wrap up this chapter on communication, I just want to stress to you just how interconnected everything is. This is why it is so um, pharmacology and other intervention mechanisms are so delicate because of the fact that they do have all these redundancies and they have all these backups. And if you knock one thing down, you may knock down something else in the same process. Or if you try to knock one thing down, the cell may just turn on a different alternate pathway to get the same response. And so it's really important that anytime you understand any of these um, cellular diseases, that there's so many different feedback networks and help how these things work. That's why it's so hard for us to treat these cellular diseases, anything that arises within a dysregulation of the cell, because there are so many feedback loops and so many different mechanisms. So this is the end of chapter 16. You have survived chapter 16. Please let me know if you have any questions and we will talk about this more in class.